I loved fairy tales when I was a kid. They had a particular quality that the Happy Hollisters and other kid books didn't have. There was this darkness about them, but a glimmer of hope too. They were heavy, but also delightful. <laughs> Years later, I discovered J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. It had the same quality, glimmers of hope and light within often oppressive darkness. This story had all the enchantment of fairy tales, but it was extended over hundreds and hundreds of pages. I loved it. When I was a young teacher, I had to defend Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time for use in my grade seven classroom. Fortunately, the key figure in the forces arrayed against me was so exhausted from a prolonged war over this book in her, their previous Christian school that they no longer had the energy to wage it all again with me. So I never really had to articulate why I thought Christians should be reading A Wrinkle in Time. The debate has popped up now and again over my teaching career. Are fairy tales appropriate for Christian families? A few years back, Harry Potter was at the center of the storm. Should Christian schools have Harry Potter in their libraries? What do we do with Game of Thrones and all the new TV series it has and will yet inspire? I now have some thoughts on the relationship between faith and fantasy. I think it's a good idea for Christians to read fairy stories and fantasy literature. I'll give you one big reason why. Fairy tales bring us back to reality. We need to live in reality. It does no one any good if we have a bunch of people in society living in illusions. Consequently, it is important that our vision of the world is shaped by reality. Some people hold to the mistaken belief that fairy tales are not realistic. In an article entitled, Christian Fantasy, Biblical or Oxymoron, the author asserts, God would not have his children take refuge in unreality. If a Christian is loving the Lord with all his mind or imagination, he will be dwelling on truth, reality, his word, and him, not on fairy tales and fantasy. Because fantasy is anti-reality, it is against godliness. It opens the doors to deceit and it is an affront to the very core of your being as a Christian. <laughs> this is extreme. But there are many Christians who are a little suspicious of fantasy because they see it as an unhealthy escape from reality. Tolkien was familiar with the argument that escaping this world through reading fantasy literature was harmful. His response to this objection is found in his essay on fairy stories. He agrees that reading such things is an escape, but not an escape from reality. He says that fairy stories are an escape to reality. To explain, he gives this illustration. On the one hand, you have the deserter who flees from his duty to cause and country. On the other hand, you have the prisoner of war who escapes back to his homeland to return and fight again another day. The flight of the deserter is not the same thing as the escape of the prisoner. Tolkien says that the escape we achieve through fairy stories is not like the flight of the deserter, but like the escape of the prisoner of war. Here are some fish that illustrates Tolkien's point in a different way. Escape is not necessarily a bad thing. Reading fantasy is not a deadly escape from reality. It is an escape to reality that is our real home. Is reality a world filled with machines and algorithms and anxiety and competition and consumption and individualism and consumerism and pragmatism and rationalism and materialism and scientism and biblicism and racism and Twitter, TikTok and Snapchat? Or is reality something else? That's Tolkien's point. Reality is not a world of isms and idolatry and Karens and cancel culture and toxicity and dehumanization. Reality is what fairy stories bring us back to. Isn't reality for Christians the vision of what we find in the Bible? Isn't the vision of reality found in the Bible a description of the really real for everyone, whether they know it or not? If it's true, wouldn't it be better if everyone lived out of this reality? Remember the fish? Well, for this reason, everyone should read fairy tales. Because fairy tales are consistent with the biblical vision of the way things really are. Let's start with a biblical and fairy tale vision of creation. Consider the apple. Where do they come from? Well, you could look it up on the internet and you'd read something like this. 
In a cross-pollinator system, pollinators such as honeybees control the transfer of pollen from one plant to another. Male gametes are contained within the pollen grains, which are released from the anthers. When a pollinator deposits pollen on the flower's stigma, the grain of pollen produces a pollen tube, through which the sperm travels down the flower's hollow style to the rounded ovary at the base. The fertilized ovules form seeds. As the petals drop or wither, the ovary starts to enlarge and ripen into what we know as fruit. Well, that's one way to look at it. That's how they teach it in school. But does this explanation describe reality? I know you are very inclined to say yes, and I am too. And that's because we've lived in this reality all our lives, so we think it's real. We've seen this sort of thing happen so many times we end up thinking that it must happen. Nature slavishly and mindlessly repeats this process again and again and again. It's natural law, and it ends in death. Cheery stuff, reality. But think about it for a sec. Better yet, look at it. A tree goes from this to this. Wow, right? And somehow, these things turn into these things. What? And they are so crispy and sweet, and perhaps the most amazing thing is, neither your doctor or your mother will ever tell you that you can't eat one. Oh yeah, I know, the cross-pollinating stigma in the hollow style with the ovary tubes and the antlers, blah, 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 blah. Look again, this becomes this, because these little guys want to do this. How do we make something so unnecessary and amazing so boring and depressing? In his book, Orthodoxy, G.K. Chesterton wonders if these things that look like mechanical operations might be evidence of God's childlike love for repetition. You know how kids want you to throw them up in the air again and again and again? Or watch the same movie 47 times a week? It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. What are apples? In reality, a necessary product of a dead process or some sort of magic event, which is more consistent with the biblical teaching of creation. The Bible begins by telling us that God made everything, and he delighted in it. He called it all good. That means, among other things, it was startling and unnecessary and wonderful. God made it all out of nothing, and that means nothing is ordinary. If we call anything ordinary, we are mistaken. Ordinary things are not real. They are figments of our twisted imaginations. And fairy tales remind us of that. They remind us of what is real. In the fairy tale, we encounter a golden apple. And we go, whoa, a golden apple, cool. But then we realize that it's no less amazing for an apple to be green or red or yellow. Fairy tales remind us that creation is not slavishly following some deterministic law, but joyfully producing green apples because the Creator delights in green apples. Green apples! Whoa! Cool! Here's a specific example from Cinderella. Cinderella's fairy godmother transforms an ordinary pumpkin into a beautiful coach gilded all over. With this transformation, we see anew the commonplace pumpkin. It's extraordinary. Chesterton asks us to consider, which is a greater marvel, a carriage or a pumpkin? There are no ordinary things. They only become ordinary when we forget. Both fairy tales and the Bible tell us the same thing about reality. It is startling and unnecessary and wonderful. And it's all a gift. And the proper response to receiving a gift is gratitude. Thank you! One of the dangerous effects of reading fairy stories is that one can break out in spontaneous praise to our Creator when one sees a pile of green apples in a grocery store. <laughs> so, fairy tales help us to see the reality of the wonder of creation. But there's another creational truth that fairy tales help us to see. The reality of limits. Cinderella's fairy godmother bade her not to stay at the ball beyond midnight. This was what Christian author G.K. Chesterton calls her incomprehensible condition of joy. 
Happiness depends on not doing something. If Cinderella stays out past midnight, she will be humiliated and lose her happy ever after ending. This is a consistent perspective that fairy tales provide, and it is consistent with the conditions found in Eden. Accept the curfew and happiness will endure. Leave after midnight and suffer humiliation. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge and enjoy paradise forever. Eat of it and you will surely die. Humanity was placed in God's good creation to enjoy and prosper within it. But there was a condition that we must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for to eat of this tree would bring death. This prohibition seems arbitrary and irrational, but upon it hinges life itself. Chesterton says that this biblical reality is all over fairy tales, where we find that incomprehensible happiness rests upon an incomprehensible condition. He calls it the doctrine of conditional joy. The fairy instruction is, you may live in a palace of gold and sapphire if you do not say the word cow. <laughs> That's Chesterton. I did a quick internet search to see what other people said about the reality of limits. All I found was page after page of stuff preaching the exact opposite. <laughs> we are resistant to the idea of limits, so we never come to understand the benefits derived from them, even if they seem arbitrary and irrational. If we want to live in reality, we need to recover a sense of limits for our own sake and for the sake of those with whom we live and for the sake of the world. Fairy tales can bring us back to reality and help us to remember that limits are real and they are good. And now let's talk about the reality of the fall. 